Itzik, thank you and uh, welcome. I guess I'm the first one to appear in a dress down mode. So it's more in the spirit of the startup activity that I'm involved with uh, these days. So this is really going to be uh, the first session where we go, so to speak, uh, down to business. And before I introduce uh, the first speaker, two comments about cyber. One is that in cyber, I had used uh, Golani speak, the one that's going to get you is the one you've not thought about. So the real question is, what type of products do you really need to develop for the frontier of cyber, and what are the type of products that you need to develop to ensure that they are here today to address future threats? So that's question number one. Question number two that I'd really like to try and understand, and I guess all of us would like to understand, unlike conventional combat, where you need to over-resource the attack side, in the cyber world, the relations are reversed. The bigger investment is being done in the defense. And how do you know whether you have invested enough? Do you need another layer? Or what is it that you need to do to get there? So with that in mind, I'd like to invite uh, the first speaker. He's from the US. It's uh, General Keith Alexander. He's currently at Ironate Cybersecurity as the CEO and President. He has a very impressive resume, so I'll read only two lines out of the resume. Between 2010 and 2014, he served as the first commander U.S. Cyber Command, there he was responsible for planning, coordinating, conducting operations, defending DOD computer networks, as well as the defense of the nation from cyber attacks. Between 2005 and 2014, he served as the 16th director of the National Security Agency. General Alexander, please. Yeah, thank you for those kind words. What an honor and privilege it is to be here. And you know, you look at this great, oh, that's a nice picture too. <laughs> You know, I have uh, 16 grandchildren, and if they saw that up there, the first thing they would be doing is putting eyes around it and defacing it. Um, there are some things I want to cover in my first four hours of this presentation. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to take that long. Uh, but I do think that what uh, Professor Ben Israel and others here have set up is extraordinary, and it's needed. And it shows you what's going on in this space. You know, I had a great opportunity to, to deal with Nadav, who's going to follow me, and over the past uh, several years, and to look at what is going on in this space to address cybersecurity. From my perspective, one of the great honors and privileges I've had, beyond being here, was as I took off the uniform, was to think about what I'm going to do next in life. And several people came up to me and said, you need to help in cybersecurity because the mission's not over. We need better cybersecurity. And I'll tell you, uh, where I'm going to end up in this discussion, where I want to start, is cybersecurity is a team sport. Between industry players, between industry and government, and between nations. We have to work together in cybersecurity. It can't be done by any one organization, as good as any one of us may think we are. It's got to be done with many of us. And so I think what Congress and our administration is pushing for in cyber legislation is vitally needed. Now, I want to set the stage by giving you some thoughts from my perspective of what's going on in cyberspace. Because as you look at it, this is the new frontier. Look at what's up here. This, isn't this tremendous? This is really neat, the way this looks, what we have. Everybody, as I was coming down, just about everybody on the aisle had an iPhone or an iPad iPad or some electronic device. We are more wired today, not from coffee, but through the devices, than ever before. Data is a natural resource. Look at how connected we are. There's a video out called Did You Know 2014. I would highly recommend you Google that and look at it. It's about five, six minutes. 
here's some of the things that they talk about in that that help lay the foundation for what's going on in cyberspace. First, this year, the amount of unique data that will be created is 3.5 zettabytes. That's 3.5 with 21 zeros after it. That's more than all the information that was created in the last 5,000 years this year. The amount of technical information is doubling every two years. The top 10 in-demand jobs in 2013 did not exist in 2004. So what does that mean? It means that if you are a college student, the information you learn here in your freshman year, 50% of it will be outdated by your junior year. Or for universities like this, that means we're preparing students for jobs that don't exist using technology that hasn't been created to solve problems we don't even know are problems. That's what's going on. And if you think about another part, you see uh, some, of, some of us might be a little bit older than the college students here. Not me, of course, but others that, that are coming up. I have four daughters and 16 grandchildren. I know I'm too young, but it's true. And it's amazing. Even the one and two-year-olds grab the iPads and are interconnected. But when you think about what that does to the workspace, it brings together four generations, the traditionalists, the boomers, the Gen X, and the millennials. That's write me, call me, email me, text me, all working in the same space. And you think about how we coordinate those things. You now have 2.4 billion people using the internet and 170 billion Google searches done a month. Think about that. Where did those searches go before Google? 14 billion text messages a day. And if you think about the way this technology is going, many of you saw IBM's Watson. This was a machine that beat the best human players in jeopardy. And one of the things that I really like about what IBM is now doing with Watson is they're working with the Human Genome Center there in New York City to address cancer, specifically brain cancer. And in addressing that with this cyber capability, some of the things that they're really focused on is, in the past, if you, if you were diagnosed with this lethal form of brain cancer, they tell you you have 14 months to live. Part of it is, how do you diagnose and get the right therapy in there? It takes too long. Five doctors take 30 days to come up with the correct regimen of chemotherapy and radiation. With Watson, they got that down to nine minutes. I believe with the technology that's in your hands and that's being created, we'll solve cancer over the next decade. It's that important. Now, if Facebook were a country, when I started talking about it in this way, they were third largest. Now they're between the first and second largest with 1.3 billion users. One out of six couples married in the U.S. met online. Now here's the thing that should concern all of you. One out of five divorces are blamed on Facebook. So I immediately went home and asked my wife, do we have a Facebook account? We need to get rid of that. Um, and I told you that any person with access to Google has access to more information than the president did in the United States in 1990. In 2019, people are saying something about wearable electronics will be a bigger industry, uh, will make more money than the airline industry does today. That's just the wearable electronics. And now here's a couple other things, then I want to go into the cyber threat kind of quickly. First, human knowledge. In 1900, they said that human knowledge would double every 100 years. In 1945, it was down to 25 years. This year, it's down to 13 months. By 2020, they say it's going to be measured in days. So 
the new issue on data is how do we capture that, how do we harness it, how do we protect it. Look at what's going on in cyberspace. And many of these things were mentioned, and I'm going to hit some highlights and then give you some thoughts and then turn it over to a good friend here in a minute. First, cyber attack, cyber espionage, cyber crime, theft of intellectual property. Jim Lewis from the C CSIS there in the United States says that global cyber crime is about $445 billion a year. That's just in cyber crime. That doesn't count the impact and theft of intellectual property. From my perspective, the theft of intellectual property is even greater than cybercrime. Now, if you think about that, now look at what's going on in cyber attacks, if you will, starting with what hit Estonia in 2007. May of 2007 over the Tallinn Monument, biggest distributed denial of service attack that we'd seen publicly came from hackers inside Russia and they knocked down the network there in Estonia. And if you talk to President Ilves, he would tell you that was a significant event for a small country that lives on the internet. They vote, they bank, they do everything on the internet. They had to cut it off internationally. Georgia, 2008, was attacked. At the same time, Russian military went into Georgia. 2008 also, interestingly, was a exploit into the U.S. defense networks in an operation that we called Buckshot Yankee. And you've heard the Deputy Secretary Lynn talk about that at the time. The reason I bring that up is it's kind of interesting is that that set of exploits into the network into some where some of the uh, malicious software got onto our classified net networks was one of the reasons that we set up U.S. Cyber Command. And in doing that, U.S. Cyber Command, I can, I'll talk about in a minute and what we did with that, but that was the reason it was created. Now jump forward to 2012. 2012 started to see a shift in what was going on. We had Saudi Aramco hit with a set of distributed denial of service attacks and a destructive attack. That destructive attack destroyed the information on over 30,000 systems. A week later, Rasgas was hit with a similar attack. In 2013, South Korea had two sets, one in March and one in June, destructive attacks. Meanwhile, our financial networks were hit with 350 distributed denial of service attacks. If you were to put those on a chart and look at those, you're seeing those pick up. What it says to me, what it should say to all of us, is that there's a lot more we need to do in cybersecurity. I want to give you some ideas of some of the things that, that we've done. And I would just acknowledge that what was addressed earlier, the exploits against Target, against eBay, against Home Depot, you keep going on and on, only highlight the concern that exists in cybersecurity. So there's several things that we need to do. I'll give you five that we talked about that are what I'll call the principles that we use for the Defense Department in talking about Cyber Command. And then I'll give you some that I've learned since I've left that we should look at from a commercial perspective. First, from a Cyber Command's perspective, a defensible cloud-based architecture. In my mind, we didn't have a cloud-based architecture and it wasn't defensible. We had 15,000 enclaves each one of those manned and operated as individual entities. And the ability to ensure all of them were properly defended was almost impossible. From my perspective, that's not a defensible architecture. Training. And here's where universities and working together really help. We need to train people on this problem. The operators, the CIOs, the CISOs, the CEOs, governments, our parliamentarians, Congress, we need to train people on what's going on here. Situational awareness. How do you see cyberspace? If you can't talk and explain what's going on, how can you defend it? That's a big gap that we have. 
For the U.S. perspective, we need cyber legislation. And I think what Secretary Johnson's pushing on that and what others and what we've pushed, we need to get that through. And then the last thing, command and control. How do you command and control this area? Now, setting up cyber command was a big step. I mentioned there is more, though, that we've learned. And I want to give you some of that because I think it sets the next stage. Remember, technology is doubling every two years. The amount of unique data that we'll create this year is more than the last 5,000. What that says to me, what we will learn, what we can learn together in cyberspace is going to be the key for setting up cybersecurity. So what do I think we need now as I look at it and I look at and have had the opportunity to talk to many folks in industry? We need a comprehensive solution. It's not a single solution. It's not fixing a firewall. It's not fixing our routers. It's not fixing the endpoint. It's the strategy of how we come up with a comprehensive solution. And what that says to me, no single company, no single country can solve this problem by themselves. This is an area where we have to work together. This is an area where if we work together, we can come up with solutions that take a lot of the cyber risk off the table. And that's what I think makes this a special area. Because it is one where partnerships are really the value in what we're going to do. And, and I think we, what's going on in the network, we don't want to slow it down. The ability to solve cancer, to improve our quality of life, to educate our kids is so compelling that we've got to solve the cybersecurity problem. So I think, first, uh, Professor Ben Israel, what you and your people have set up here is extraordinary. Second, it has been a distinct privilege and honor to partner with some of those, and one of those is the new CEO for, and co-founder of Team 8, Nadav, who will come up next. I think that shows you one set of partnerships, and for what we've got to do, what I've got to do is come up with more partnerships on our side, and we're working that. So, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. I think what you're doing at this university is extraordinary, and it has been an honor and privilege to talk to all of you. Thank you very much.